Good morning and welcome to this gathering of Emmanuel Bible Church. It is my pleasure to welcome you to do what we've been called and created to do, and that's worship our Creator God through Christ in uh, spirit and in truth. And so to do that, to call us to worship God, I'd like to draw our attention to two verses in the Psalms. Psalm chapter 93, verses 1 to 2. The psalmist here is is calling us to understand and to see the greatness of God and that he reigns, a theme that we'll be singing about later. So follow along and allow God's word to dwell in you richly, then to invoke you to sing. Psalm 93, verses 1 to 2. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. This is the God that we have gathered this morning to worship. This is the God that we serve. He reigns. He is established. And yet we can call him Father because of what he has done for us in Christ. Father, we praise you for that. We praise you that you have equipped us to worship you, that you have given us your spirit so that we can be united and say that we are of one body, one spirit, and one Lord. We praise you for Christ, and we ask now that the Holy Spirit would equip us to sing praises, to sing of your grace to us. May that be on our lips. May you equip us to hear your word And may it pierce us, may it convict us, may it challenge us, and may we leave here edified to show forth your Son, in whose name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Please rise.
wraps himself in love And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how to wait she stands
Good morning, Emmanuel. It's uh, my privilege to be able to lead us in prayer, and before I do so, I have some good news to announce to you. I received word, uh, what was it, Friday morning, I guess it was Friday morning, uh, from Sean Carlin that Audrey Carlin had been born. So she's, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, we can clap for that. That's uh, worthy of, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, You guys can continue to pray for Jess, though. She's uh, asking that we would all pray for her because blood pressure kind of needs to get regulated, things like that. So if you would, please keep them in prayer. Uh, Pray for development for Audrey that would be uh, appropriate and and hitting the milestones, things like that. But praise the Lord uh, for her birth, and we will do just that in our prayer. So I ask you to unite your heart with mine as we go to the Lord and we ask the living God, on behalf of us and on behalf of uh, these requests that we bring before him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you are great and magnanimous. You are high and holy. You are exalted over all of creation. You are strong. You are powerful. You are wonderfully good. And, Father, we are weak. We are lowly. If left to ourselves, Lord, we have, we have nothing. Apart from you, we are nothing. Scripture says that from dust we were formed, and to dust we shall return. Lord, we are nothing without you. Indeed, as we have just been singing, Lord, if your breath, if it departs from us, then we would be nothing. So we give you all of the glory. We give you all of the honor. We give you all of the praise. We depend upon you. You are God and we are not. Father, we come to you humbly this morning. We realize that outside of Christ, if it weren't for him, we would have nothing to present to you, Lord. We would have no one to plead on our behalf. We would have no one to atone for our sins, no one to make us right before you. So Father, first and foremost, we acknowledge your grace to us in Christ. We see your goodness to us in Christ. Lord, we praise you that the Son did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant. And by dying on the cross for us. And Lord, we praise you that just as we celebrated last week that the resurrection is real. That it happened, Lord. That Jesus Christ is no longer on the cross. That he has ascended to his throne on high. He is at your right hand. He is waiting, Lord, until you make his enemies his footstool. And indeed, you're doing that even now. Father, we praise you that you are the sovereign over all creation. You're sovereign over our individual lives. You're sovereign over the life of this church. And Lord, you are sovereign over our nation and all of this world. You are powerful. And Lord, you work all things together for the good of those who love you. So Father, as we come to you with these prayer requests, Lord, we we know that in some way you are working these things to our good. We ask, God, that you would give us the eyes of faith uh, to believe when we cannot see and to behold your beauty and goodness when in the midst of our circumstances we just see things that might discourage us or things that might uh, seek to rob us of our joy. Uh, Father, I I think of as we look out at the national landscape and what's going on uh, in our country at large, we think uh, politically of the the turmoil that we've experienced, the the deep division that is in our nation. Uh, Father, we pray that by uh, the power of the gospel that you might reform our nation, that you might renew us, that you might even revive us, God. We pray that the gospel would go forward in power That people would be uh, left feeling the emptiness of atheism and agnosticism, of skepticism and cynicism. And Lord, that they would 
come to the beauty of Christ, the one who can satisfy all of our deepest, truest longings. And Father, in doing so, we pray that you would uh, transform cities and neighborhoods, towns, even our very nation, Lord. And we pray, Father, that by the power of the gospel that your church would be built. And no matter what happens, no matter what happens politically, Father, we know that your church will be the last one standing when it all ends. Father, that the gates of hell, though they should attempt to stand against your church, they will never prevail. And so, Father, we praise you. We praise you for the promises that your bride will conquer. And Lord, that gives us great hope as we look forward to the second coming of Christ. We know that it is sure in your word. We thank you that we have the message of, of, of lo, I am coming quickly. And Father, we look expectantly. We wait for him to come like a thief in the night. No one else might anticipate it, but Father, I pray that we would be those who are always looking forward to your coming, always eagerly anticipating the return of the Lord Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that your grace would continually sustain us, that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us. Father, I realize that there are people in our congregation this morning who have gone through tremendous loss. And Father, would you minister in particular to them? Would you bind up their wounds by the power of the Holy Spirit? Would you strengthen them by the work of Christ? That they would rest in the goodness and the majesty of Jesus Christ alone? And Father, I pray that you would build up your church even here locally. Make us stronger, Lord, as a, as a church, as a, as a body of Christ. Father, we pray that we would be imitators of the Lord Jesus. That we would feel the joy of your Holy Spirit. We pray that our testimony of faith, that it would go out. And Lord, that it would reap fruit in the hearts of unbelievers around us. That people would be converted as a result of our testimony. Give us boldness in declaring the gospel of the God who saved us. The one who resurrected our dead lives so that we would sing his praise forever. Father, we know that you're powerful. That you can give new life and we pray that you would. And in our praying for new life, Lord, we recognize the very tangible way in which you have given new life. Uh, Father, thank you for the birth of Audrey Carlin. We pray, Lord, even now for Sean and Jess in these early moments of transitioning from parents of one to parents of two. We pray that you would give them sustaining grace, that you would comfort them. We pray uh, in particular for Jess's health, Lord. Would you allow her her vitals and everything else to be stabilized so that they might be released from the hospital. And Lord, we also pray that Audrey would reach the appropriate milestones that lie in front of her. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity as a congregation to celebrate with this dear family. I pray that we would encourage them, that we would strengthen them, and that we would be encouraged by them. And Father, we... Uh, Lastly, Lord, we think of the power of the gospel message that you've entrusted to us. Lord, we pray that we would speak boldly, that we would declare the words of life, because we have nothing else if we don't have Christ. So would you empower us, Lord, to encourage each other with that gospel message and to challenge the unbelieving world around us with the gospel message? Father, don't let this church be a church that exists to please man. Let it be a place where we exist to please you and you alone. Oh, Father, we pray that our conduct toward one another would be blameless. We pray that the outside world would see us and see an example of what it means to live a life devoted to God. And Lord, when we do represent you poorly, we pray that we would repent quickly, that we would return wholeheartedly to you, and Father, that we would know that it's only by the power of the gospel that we will be saved, sanctified, and eventually glorified. 
Lord, would you make us increase and abound in love for each other and for all as we abound in love for you. Would you establish our hearts blameless and holy before you, our God and Father, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. We ask it in his name for his glory. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to continue to worship the Lord, and we do so by uh, receiving an offering as devoted to God. So I just encourage you guys to remember, I know I often do this, remember that this is an opportunity to give thanks to God. This is not anything else if it's not an act of worship. So let's go to the Lord. Let's present our gifts and our offerings with a joyful heart to the Lord. I'll ask the men to come forward. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. If you don't have a a copy of the scriptures, we've provided one. There's one underneath the seat in front of you. And in that Bible, it is page 572, or if it's a a large print uh, text, it is page 727. Page 572 or page 727. Isaiah chapter 51, and I will read the entirety of the chapter. Isaiah 51, beginning in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, 
and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I... I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? Of the son of man who who is made like grass? And have forgotten the the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy? And where is the wrath of the oppressor? He who is bowed down shall speedily be released. He shall not die and go down to the pit, neither shall his bread be lacking. I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name, and I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand, establishing the heavens and laying the foundations of the earth and saying to Zion, you are my people. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne. There is none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction famine and sword, who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in a net. They are full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, your God, who pleads the cause of his people, Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering. The bowl of wrath you shall drink no more. And I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, Bow down, that we may pass over. And you have made your back like the ground and like the street for them to pass over. May God bless the reading of his word and And I encourage you guys to to keep your Bible open to that chapter. That's the chapter I'm going to be preaching to us momentarily. But for now, we are going to stand and respond to the reading of God's Word. We're going to stand and sing in Christ alone. So please stand.
Well, good morning, Emmanuel. I am grateful to see that you all survived the great earthquake of 24. Amen. You are not only alive, but it seems as though you're all doing well. So praise God. I say that halfway in jest. It's no small thing that you lived through an earthquake and a rather violent storm all in one week. So uh, praise God. Jesus says that heaven and earth will pass away, but what? My word will stand forever. If anything reminds us of that, it's an earthquake. So the, the subject of my sermon this morning is the fear of man versus the fear of God. The fear of man versus the fear of God. I don't know everything about everyone in this room, but I know enough about me and enough about other people to know that one thing that we all have in common is that we fear man too much and that we do not fear God enough. Every single one of us, we fear man too much, and we do not fear God enough. But instead of just asserting that we all fear man way too much, let me backtrack just a little bit and try and convince you that you fear man more than you think that you do. Here's how you can identify the fear of man in your life. You often worry that you said the wrong thing. If you fear man, you become paralyzed after a conversation, and you're pouring over every word that you said, and you're worried that someone might misinterpret you, and that they won't like you as a result of that. So you constantly wonder, did I offend them? Or, or maybe you fear man, and your fear of man causes you to, to say things that are sinful. They're unbefitting to a Christian because you want to impress others. Or Here's how you know you fear man. You'll confess your sins to God, but you won't confess them to anyone else because you can't deal with how they might think about you. But it's not just what you will say. It's often what you won't say. So if you fear man, you'll never have fully transparent conversations because you're always afraid that that other person will identify you by what you say rather than by the blood of Christ. That's how you know you fear man. Or you'll prefer to talk about your past sin, what you did a long, long time ago, rather than what you still struggle with today, because if you were to share what you struggle with today, 
well, again, that could uh, somehow uh, hinder your identity in your standing before somebody else. Or it could lead, the fear of man could lead you not to speak up for what is right because you fear disapproval from somebody else. Or, or if you don't speak up, or maybe if you do, you can replay conversations in your mind. You think of all the ways that you should have said something better. You fear man if you resent people when they're not impressed by you. If you get uncomfortable when someone else is being praised more than you and you see that as a threat, well, that's a sure sign that you fear man. The fear of man could cause you to avoid certain people. It could uh, cause you to, to walk a, a certain way, even in this room, to walk around people rather than to walk by them because you don't want to have that conversation with them. You ever do that? I've done that before. As one of your shepherds, I can confess, I've done that before. Or on the opposite side, you try to put yourself in someone else's path so that you can somehow get them to notice you. I think everyone's been at a party when you're talking to somebody else and you can tell that they don't really want to be talking to you. <laughs> they want to be talking to somebody else. They're looking past you. They're looking at the people that they want to be talking to. Well, that's the fear of man. They're canvassing the room. They're trying to, to schmooze in some way to make themselves look better. Or you might fear man if you're unwilling to pursue relationships with someone because you don't know that they already like you. If, if you think, uh, I, I, I don't want to put myself out there, well, it might be because you fear man. Here's another sign that you fear man. You spend more time talking about a conversation than you spent in the actual conversation. Have you done that before? I've done that before. That tells you that you fear man. Or you overreact when someone says something negative about you. You're vindictive. That's because you fear man. You fall apart when someone falsely accuses you. Or maybe, this is a totally different direction, maybe you overwork because you fear man. Maybe you work so hard and you worry about the quality of your work because your identity is in your work. So you dare not produce something halfway because it would reveal to others that you're not perfect. And that is your fear. You fear man. At the end of a list like that, every single one of us, we are guilty in some way. We all fear man way too much. And why is that? Because we fear God too little. We fear God too little. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 25 says, The fear of the man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. That verse tells us two things. First, the fear of man, it relies on disguise. And secondly, it intends to harm. The fear of man will catch you, kill you, clean you, and eat you. That's what it will do. That's what it will do. Any Jew would have been familiar with this, but we live in New Jersey, so let me explain. The fear of man is like a trap that is set for an animal. It's baited. It's just waiting for some unsuspecting victim to come along and fall into its enticement. Now, what do you know about a trap? No animal goes into the trap unless there's something that's alluring to them. You don't go into the trap it, just ready to die. No, the only reason a trap works is because it appears to be something better than death. Well, that's how the fear of man works. So uh, what's the fear of man at its core? The fear of man is the concern with pleasing man to the neglect of obedience to God. It's when we place something created above the Creator. Some creature ahead of the Creator. We serve them instead of serving God. And the problem with the fear of man is that you always, always, always obey the one that you fear most. You always obey the one that you fear most. Anything that vies for our obedience above God is a snare. It's a snare, church. It will eventually, ultimately lead in death. If you see, the question is never about whether or not we will fear something or someone. We all fear someone. Every single one of us, we fear someone. The question is, who will we fear? Who will we fear? God or any and everyone else? That's the situation that Judah is in in Isaiah 51. 
They're tempted to look out at all of the people that oppress them, everyone who seems so big and powerful while they are weak and despised, and they're tempted to give them undue weight. That's what they're doing. The people of Israel, they are suffering. And in the midst of their suffering, there is something so enticing to them. The the, the thing that they are clinging to, that they want to go to, it's the trap that is set for them, it's baited, it's calling their name. But at the same time, at the same time, God doesn't want them to fall into the trap. And Emmanuel, he doesn't want us to fall into it either. So get this picture in your mind. God is standing before us, and he knows that there is a trap that we are all tempted to. On one side, you have the fear of man, and if you walk into that trap, you will die. Maybe not physically, but spiritually, and eventually physically. And the whole world is luring us into that trap. The whole world is luring you to say, no, it's actually safe to fear man. And then on the other side, the only other option is to trust God alone. It's to trust God alone and to fear God alone. That's the predicament of uh, Isaiah 51. Here's my first point. One of our greatest problems in the Christian life is that often we fear man more than we fear God. Consider verse 7. Look at verse 7 with me. Listen to me, you who know righteousness. The people in whose heart is my law, fear not the reproach of men, nor be dismayed at their revilings. Or look again at verse 12. I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? Of the son of man who is made like grass. And you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy And where is the wrath of that oppressor? Did you notice in verse 7 that Isaiah, he is not speaking to unbelievers in Israel. No, he's talking to the baptized church folks. He's talking to us, church. He's talking to us. In verse 1, he says, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. So here's the terrifying reality for all of us. It's possible to be pursuing righteousness and at the same time, to be fearing man. Judah's greatest temptation was that they thought that they should be more concerned with people than God. Unless we think that we are any better than them, remember something for just one second. People much stronger than you and I have fallen into temptation of the fear of man. What was it that led Peter to deny Jesus? You remember the servant girl? A lowly person, somebody who was an afterthought in society. But Jesus gave, or sorry, Jesus didn't do this. Peter gave her more weight than he should have. He made her seem huge in front of him. He denied Jesus because of the fear of man. And if Peter denied Jesus because he feared a lowly servant girl, then we need to be leery because the fear of man, it doesn't always appear as great big opportunities. Sometimes it's in the simplest of things. I don't want to pick on Peter, but there are a lot of examples. There's another example of fear in his life. Even after Christ had resurrected and Peter had been restored by Christ, what was it that caused Peter not to eat with the Gentiles in Galatians chapter 2? It was the fear of the circumcision party. Paul says that he was afraid to offend them. Well, here's my point. It's very simple. If an apostle who was divinely instructed by Christ to preach the gospel and establish the church, he had the Spirit of God in great measure, if he could fall into the fear of man, do you think little old Adam Jacobs in Schoolies Mountain can do that? Yes, he can, and so can you. So can you. Friends, we had all better be careful because the fear of man, it exists in us. But though we all struggle with the fear of man, be careful because the fear of man, it has real consequences. What was it that led Pilate to deliver Jesus to be crucified? It was the fear of man. Remember what the Jews said? 
They said, we're going to tell Caesar that, that you are allowing a king other than you or other than Caesar to rule and reign. That's what they leveraged over Pilate. They said, we're going to tell them that the Jews have a king other than you. It was the fear of man. Pilate was afraid of what Caesar might do as a result of what they would say. Emmanuel, when we walk in the fear of man functionally, we forget the Lord our maker. Look at verse 13. The fear of man is a snare because man is a false god. Man is not God. But the fear of the Lord, it's safe because he is God. What do you think stands behind so much of our struggle with idolatry even now as Christians? What makes you think that you have to have that nice car or the newest phone? What makes you want the bigger house or the perfect lawn or the the best social media pictures or the perfect family photos? What makes us so unwilling to be bold for the gospel? Or here's another question. Why do you think that you want so deeply for your kids to outperform everyone else? Why? Because you fear man. So much of our sin goes back to this very simple point. We fear people more than we fear God. But though it's simple, it has profound implications on our lives. Emmanuel, the the fear of man is so wrapped up into our sin that you can guarantee that everyone in this room struggles with it in some way. So much so that if I ask you if you struggle with the fear of man and you say no, I'll just assume it's because you're afraid of what I might think about you. (laughs) Every single one of us, we all fear man more than we should. Every single one of us. But allow me in particular, to to speak pastorally to the young people in the room. And and when I say young, I mean anyone younger than us dinosaurs in our 30s. So anyone younger than that, you are young. But young people, you are at an especially vulnerable stage in life. Because when you're young, your peers have such a huge influence over you. And if you're a young person, you probably probably care more about what your friends think about you than anyone else. That's probably true for young people in this room. Or if it's not a a friend, you probably esteem an older sibling and you want their approval. Well, what's the danger of that? The danger is that the fear of man is so subtle. No animal becomes ensnared unless the snare is attractive. And it's attractive to us, isn't it? As Christians, when we give in to the fear of man, our true identity, it becomes more and more hidden. It's like a a layer of overgrowth that that clouds out our ultimate identity in Christ. It can even erode. Fearing others, no matter how old you are, it will eventually make you a captive to their desires. If you fear man, eventually you will be their slave. Eventually. Because you always obey what you fear most. When we fear man, people become bigger than they actually are. That's why trusting in God is the safest thing that you can do this morning. Because fearing man is the most dangerous thing that you can do. Because when we walk in the fear of man, it makes those that we fear, it makes their opinions loom so much larger in our minds than they should. Do you remember the great blockbuster of 1989, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? You guys remember that? Some of you, about half of you do. Uh, If you're a millennial, you probably watched it. Uh, Wayne Zielinski, he had his half-inch thick glasses. He was a a nerd. You guys remember this? He he has a shrinking machine in his garage. If you've ever seen the movie, then you know he's a scientist. He's He's building a shrinking machine in his garage. And accidentally, he shrinks the kids to a microscopic size. So the whole rest of the movie, they are are tiny, and they're trying to figure out how to come back to being life-sized. Well, that movie, it gave me nightmares of ants as a child, so that's why it's still emblazoned in my mind today. But the fear of man is like the shrinking machine. The fear of man, it inevitably, when we fear man, we become tiny, and everyone else seems to loom so much larger than they really are. That's what happens when you fear man. One man said this, all experiences of the fear of man share at least one common feature. People are big. 
When we fear man, it's the sure sign that people have grown to idolatrous proportions in our lives. They control us. And what you will see in Isaiah 51 is that there is only one, control, one seat in the control room of our hearts, Emmanuel. So if someone else is occupying it, God isn't, and that's a problem. When people loom large, God appears tiny. He appears insignificant. This is why the greatest thing that we can do to address our fear of man is to see God as awesome and as big and beautiful as he really is. Emmanuel, when God is small, when he's peripheral, when he's harmless, then the shadows in the eyes of others, they will haunt you. They will haunt you. Their expectations will control you. Their disappointments will crush you. Their anger will undo you. EBC, if we are going to live outside of the enslaving fear of others, then God has to be enormous. He has to be enormous. Don't settle for God being anything less than enormous. I mean, bigger than all of the expectations of others, bigger than their disappointments, bigger than their anger. God himself has to be big enough to fear, and that's exactly what Isaiah is saying in Isaiah 51. Emmanuel, it's only when God becomes our greatest fear that he can become our greatest comfort. It's only when you fear him above everything else that he can comfort you no matter what the situation is. So allow him to be your fear. Allow him to be your dread. Honor him as holy and he will be a sanctuary to you. Look at verse 12. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies or the son of man who is made like grass. The solution of the fear of man is to replace it with a greater fear, the fear of God. And let me explain what I mean. It's not that we fear that God is waiting to pounce on us. That's not the idea. No, that's the fear of the judgment of God. And the, the person who should experience that kind of fear is the person who doesn't have Christ this morning. No, the fear of God it's a new attitude of, of openness and submission to God, and it's only created by his love. Lewis said, we fear God when we recognize that in him we come against something so much bigger than everything else, so much so superior, immeasurably beyond anything else. We fear God when we remember his awesome love. That's why if we're in Christ... His perfect love, what does it do, as John says? Casts out fear. It pushes it out. When you see that you have been loved perfectly by an omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful God, it casts the fear of man out. And we love why? We love because he loved us. The fear of God is being eager. Eager to live for the glory of the one who has loved us so well. So replace your fear of man with your desire to live for God and to live for his glory. Every single one of us has a master. That's the truth. Every single one of us has somebody that is demanding our heart and our affections this morning. And whoever you fear, that's who it is. The Bible says that one of the greatest dangers in your life is that you will fear and worry what someone else has to say about you more than you fear God. You will serve the idol of approval. As John Bunyan put it, you will bow down to the fear of losing man's favor, love, help, and friendship. It will cripple you. It will riddle you with anxiety if you allow it. So here's my second point. One of the greatest needs in our Christian life is to see the awesome work of God and to fear God alone. It's to see the awesome work of God and to fear God alone. Over and over again, in Isaiah 51, God says that he is the one that we need to pay attention to. I counted it myself so that you wouldn't have to. God mentions himself 41 times in Isaiah 51 because he wants you to see that the solution to fearing man is to look to God. He says, the Lord, your God, focus on me. Because when you're stayed on God, it doesn't matter what anybody else does to you. You don't care. 
Emmanuel, when we desire to live for God and to please God above everything else, then all of the things that once consume so much of our time and so much of our energy, they're put in the right places, aren't they? That's exactly how God wants you to live. Do you believe that? He wants you to put off the fear of man. He wants us to have such a right and holy fear of him that everything else seems tiny and insignificant compared to him. Is that true for you this morning? Well, the fear of God, it transforms us. It, it makes us say, do my coworkers like me? Well, who cares? God has known and loved me. It makes us say, will my classmates accept me if they know the real me? Well, great if they do, but even if they don't, there's an eternal king who has loved me with an everlasting love. I don't need them to love me. I don't need it. Will my neighbors think I'm weird if they know I'm a Christian? Well, it's better that they think that you are weird and have the opportunity to hear the gospel of Christ than they think well of you and never hear the message. Put off the fear of man. Emmanuel, God is pleading with us not to walk into the snare. He gives us everything that we need not to be ensnared by the fear of man. First, he tells us there's a trap. He tells us where the trap is, what it is. He tells us why we should avoid it. He even tells you how you should avoid it. So what will that mean if we walk into it? It'll be our fault. Because God gives us every example of why we should not fear man. Here are four ways that we move beyond the fear of man. Number one, we walk in the fear of the Lord by remembering the sovereignty of God. Look in verses 1 through 8. God reminds Israel that he is the one who called Abraham and Sarah. He is the one who multiplied them. He is the one who saved them. Then in verses 9 and 10, God reminds them he's the one who delivered them out of the Exodus. Do you remember, did you see how he talks about cutting off Rahab and the dragon? Were any of you confused when you read that, those verses? I was. And so I looked it up. And the nerds tell me, the Hebrew guys, they tell me that that language of Rahab and the dragon that refers to Egypt and the Exodus. So God is saying, friends, that he is the one with miraculous power to deliver them. That's why they should fear him above all of the other uh, surrounding things that they're tempted to fear. And the same is true for you, Emmanuel. God says, look to me, look to my power and my salvation, my sovereignty. You have a testimony. You have a testimony of faith. That's all the reason that you need not to fear man. God has saved you. He has brought you out of things that would enslave you to others. So we learn to fear God above man by remembering God's power to deliver. He's the God of our past. He's the God of our present. He's the God of our future. So why? Why would we be afraid of men and women who will die when we serve an eternal king who will live forever? God says in verse 6, look at verse 6, the earth it's going to wear out like a garment. You, you ever get an old shirt or something like that and you think, man, this one's got to go to the trash. It's got too many holes. Uh, it, it's beyond its use. Well, that's what God says of those who are our enemies. He says, my salvation will be forever. God's righteousness will never be dismayed. You see, fearing man, it makes all the sense in the world if this life is all we have, doesn't it? But it's not. Last Sunday, we celebrated the resurrection of Christ. Is, is Christ still resurrected today? Yes, amen. You better say yes. Somebody better say yes. Because if he's not resurrected, then what are we celebrating? He is resurrected. Paul says, we do not look to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, what are they? They're transient. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Secondly, when we walk in the fear of the Lord, it restores our sanity. If you walk in the fear of man long enough, you're going to be anxious, you're going to be worried, you're going to be depressed, you're going to constantly be uh, uncertain, and the reason why is because you're always on trial of, what, of the court of public opinion. You're always wondering, what do they think about? What, what do they think about how I said that one thing? You're always looking for certainty. But when we walk in the fear of the Lord, it allows us to see things rightly. We become sane when we fear God. Look at verse 9. Israel had said, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. 
They're crying, God, wake up. Wake up, God, hear us. But God doesn't need an alarm clock because God doesn't take naps. <laughs> Look at God's response. Look at verse 17. You have to see this. Wake yourself. Wake yourself. Stand up, O Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the, of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs of the bowl the cup of staggering. God says, I'm not the one sleeping. You are. He says, you need to wake up, Israel. You need to... To wake up because the fear of man, it has driven them crazy. They're drinking the cup of the wrath of God because they fear man. They, they can't interpret their lives because they're so riddled with the fear of man. They don't walk in the fear of God. Proverbs 14 verse 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Do you believe that? Fearing God is a fountain of life. It's going to bless you. It's going to sustain you so that you would turn away from the snares of death. The fear of man, it will eat away at everything. It will kill your relationships. It will kill your budget. It will kill your schedule, your ministry, your convictions, your sleep, even your sanity until either you perish or you put it to death. What will you choose? What will you choose? Those are the two options. Point number three. We walk in the fear of the Lord by remembering that the wrath of God has been satisfied. So how do we walk in the fear of the Lord? We remember that God's wrath has been satisfied. Now when you heard me say that, you, you might have thought, wait, that doesn't sound right, Adam. If the, if the wrath of God has been satisfied and we're resting in that, that wouldn't, wouldn't that lead us to, to be more casual? If God's already paid everything, wouldn't that just lead us to kind of be a little more laissez-faire? No. I picked on Peter at the beginning of this sermon as one being ruled by the fear, of, the fear of man. But I am sure that Peter would want me to give you the fuller picture. So lest I get a holy side eye when I reach the pearly gates, let me show you how Peter was transformed. Open to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Go all the way to the right almost and you will find 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll pick it up in verse 21. For to this you have been called, Peter says, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." The fundamental message of Christianity is that on account of our sin, we have strayed from God. That, that we had departed from God. We were deserving of God's wrath. So remember this, Emmanuel, if you're a Christian, and most of you are here this morning, if you had died before the grace of God, then you would have drunk the cup of God's wrath for the rest of eternity. That's what you were owed by God. That's what you were owed. In all of its horror, in all of its bitterness, you would have experienced that. But there is one who came into this world not to be served, not to uh, be lauded by the world, but to give his life, to be reviled by this world, to suffer on account of this world. And yet at every moment when the fear of man would have been so tempting, he never flinched, never he kept his eyes upon the Father. He kept his eyes single-minded in devotion to the Father. And he took all of our sins upon himself. He bore them all on the cross. And now we're healed. So there's no more wrath for us. Israel, they were drinking the cup of God's wrath in Isaiah 51. But not you. No longer do you perform in the, in the court of man. And the reason why is because the fear of man... If you're doing that, you're always awaiting for a new verdict. You're always waiting. Are they going to like me? Did I do that right? Are they going to be pleased with me? 
No, not us. Because we don't need to perform anymore. The wrath of God has been satisfied, church. You don't need to satisfy the wrath of somebody else. God's wrath has been satisfied on your account through the blood of His Son. And because God loves us, He accepts us. So we don't have to build up our resume before other people. We don't need to look good before others. So praise God. Live in the freedom of that this morning. Live in the freedom of that. So what should that reality, that that we are healed by His wounds, what should that lead us to? Here's how it applies in your relationship to others. Look at chapter 3, verse 14 of 1 Peter. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. And then listen to what Peter says. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. The grace of the gospel, look at this. This is very important for you to see. It can transform a man-fearer into those who can stand even when others revile and slander. That's our hope as, as those who struggle with the fear of man, that God's grace can transform us. But then look at what he says in verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You know what our world needs? We need Christians with spines of steel. Is that you? Are you cowering in the fear of man? The world needs a strong church, those who won't cave, Those who are fortified because the wrath of God has been paid. And so we stand on His Word because we have nothing else to claim. We have nothing else. Emmanuel, praise God that we can rest in the work of a king who has taken the cup of wrath every last drop. Every last drop. There is none that remains for you. In a moment, we're actually going to partake of the Lord's table and that's what we're remembering. That the wrath of God has been drunk in full measure by Christ. So no longer do we have to fear what anyone will say. And first and foremost, we never have to fear again that God will say, that's not enough. You have more to pay. No, in the blood of Christ, we have everything. All righteousness has been given to us by Christ. So we walk in the fear of the Lord by remembering that the wrath of God has been satisfied. Fourthly, We walk in the fear of the Lord by having a correct view of ourselves. Look at verse 11. Isaiah says that we are going to share in everlasting joy. So sorrow and sighing, they're going to be gone forever. There's coming a day when all of your sadness, all of your sorrow will be gone if you are a Christian. There's coming a day when infinite joy will be yours. And here's the good news. This Sunday, we're one Sunday closer to it. Amen? Aren't you excited? Aren't you excited? Aren't you looking forward to that? There's coming a day when the big bad world and the wrath of this big bad world will totally dissipate and the tables are going to be turned and you will be exalted. Look at verse 8. Here's why we don't fear man. Because in that day, the moth, it will eat them up like a garment and the worm will eat them like wool. But what's going to stand forever? God's righteousness, God's salvation, God's salvation to all generations. Emmanuel, the fear of God, it has an amazing ability to comfort us when everything else is chaotic. Have you experienced this in your life? The the comfort of knowing that I am walking with God. I don't need to be afraid. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? If I'm right with God, it doesn't matter what they do to me because I'm right with him. Can you say that? Is he your comfort? The Lord of hosts is his name. He says to Emmanuel Bible Church this morning, you are my people. I am your God. As subtle as the fear of man is, so much uh, is at stake. Our ability to savor Christ, our witness to the darkened world, our willingness to love and correct our brother and sister in Christ, our freedom to obey the King who is in heaven, All of it, all of it comes down to whether or not we will fear God or we will fear man. The fight's not going to be won by analyzing yourself. It's not going to be won by having anxiety. The fight is going to be won by relentlessly exposing our weakness of faith to the fearful, wonderful God, our Father. 
You see, we walk in the fear of God by having a correct view of ourselves. And the only way for us to do that is by submitting ourselves to the word, by fellowshipping with the church, and by being rooted in Christ. You might not think that what you're doing this Sunday is all that spectacular, but what you're doing this morning is fortifying yourself not to submit to the fear of man. Every Sunday that you submit yourself to the preaching of God's word and you hear these things, you say, I'm not going to fear man. I'm going to be conformed to what God has to say of me first and foremost. This is my prayer for us, Emmanuel, that we would be so struck by the fear of God that nothing else would even matter. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, there's an amazing verse where Luke says that the church had peace and it was being built up. And he says, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Emmanuel, when we walk in the fear of the Lord, we experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. When we walk in the fear of man, there's no comfort to be found, is there? No, there's anxiety, there's stress. Because man and his opinions, they're always changing. One hour, the wind blows this way, the next it blows the opposite direction. But when you walk in the fear of the Lord, God himself, the third person of the Trinity, will comfort you. That's your great hope this morning. He will comfort you. I don't know about you, but I want to feel that. I want to feel that comfort. I want us to feel that comfort as a congregation, that we will fear God even though all the earth gives way. Here's some application for you this morning. Number one, confess your fear of man. Confess your fear of man. We all know that you fear it. Confess it. Confess your fear of man. Recognize that you have a problem with the fear of man. What does al say? The first step to, <laughs> to recovering is admitting you have a problem. Well, that's the same thing with the fear of man. You have to admit that you have a problem with it. Secondly, have scripture inscribed on your mind. Meditate on verses like Hebrews 13, verse 6. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? Meditate on that verse. Or think of what Jesus commands us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who can kill the soul, or the body, sorry, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul. Thirdly, Rejoice in the one who has covered all of your shame. Emmanuel, if you are a Christian, then he loves you with an everlasting love. You, you don't need somebody else to satisfy you. You don't need to be liked by somebody else. You don't need to fear others if you are the object of God's love. Number four, question your fear of man. Question your fear of man. What exactly are you afraid of and why? Why? Do you really have good reason to fear, and especially in light of uh, Matthew 10, 28, that, that we are, are forgiven by the one who can destroy both the body and soul? Question your fear of man. If, if you articulate you, the, why you fear man, what it does, excuse me, is, is it exposes fear as the pathetic thing that it really is. It, it's just pathetic. If you're a parent, this, this will uh, resonate with you in some way. You've inevitably experienced something like this. Easter Sunday, Allie and I, uh, we find Augie. He's littered with open candy and uh, wrappers all around him. There are crumbs all over. It's an obvious case of illicit breaking and entering into the Easter basket. So we call the primary suspect for questioning. And of course, Augie looks up at us with a noticeable ring of chocolate around his mouth and with crumbs all over his hands, and I say, son, did you eat some of your Easter candy without asking? And of course, Augie looks me in the face with his own face littered with candy evidence, and he responds that he might have had a few. <laughs> so I ask him, I say, are you sure you didn't eat a lot? There are a lot of wrappers here. And nope, nope, I, I, I don't know how those got there. I'm not really sure. Uh, and, and he assures me, I've only eaten a few pieces, Dad. Well, we might laugh, but that's exactly what you do with the fear of man. The fear of man is littered all over your existence. You got the chocolate ring all around your mouth. 
It's evident to everybody that you fear man. Everybody knows it. We all do it. So own up to the evidence and rely upon the grace of God. Confess your fear of man, and it will become smaller and smaller. It will be treated like the pathetic little thing that it is. Number five, courageously confront your fear of man. We must obey God rather than man. Obedience calls for courage, Emmanuel. Pray for courage. Courage is not the absence of the emotion of fear. No, courage is the resolve that despite what we feel, we are going to keep moving forward. So we exercise our trust in God out of obedience. What does God call us to in his word? Be strong and what? Courageous. You need courage in the Christian life. If you're going to face your fear of man, you have to be courageous. And you have to know that God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Rest in his promises. Number six, don't be surprised when someone tells you that they fear man. Don't be surprised. Don't be caught off guard when somebody tells you, yeah, I struggle with that. If you do that, if you're, if you're caught off guard and you think, you do that? What's going to happen? Well, our community of saints, as a body of believers, it's going to become more and more closed off. We're going to say, no, I, I can't share that. Because this person acts as though that's the unthinkable for me to fear man. No, except that yes, we fear man, yet we're so free in Christ that we can confess our sin because no longer are we under the banner of whatever that fear is. We're under the banner of Christ. I don't know what number this is, but here's the next one. <laughs> Relentlessly pursue being enamored with God. That's the best thing that you can do to fight the fear of man. To let God be as grand as he actually is in your mind. When the fear of God is supplanting the fear of man in your heart, it will inevitably lead to fruit. So it will cause you to look more and more like Christ. The person who fears God will fear nothing else. But the person who does not fear God will fear everything else. Parents, let me paint a scenario. I'm almost done. Let me paint a scenario. Your little boy or your little girl grows up, they become confused, the world gets its claws into your child and they start to live an unrepentant homosexual lifestyle. And everything within you wants them to love you, it wants them to uh, feel loved by you, so in that moment, what is it that will keep you from caving on everything you know to be good, true, and beautiful? It's the fear of the Lord. You fear God more than you fear man. If you don't fear God more than you fear man, you'll always be beholden to what others think of you. But if you fear God, no matter what happens, you'll be able to say, God, I can rest. I can rest because I know that being with you is better than the whole world being on my side and being without you. Here's my last point of application. Don't be so impressed with others. Don't be so impressed with others. They fear man just like you do. Everyone around you, everyone in this room, fears man in some way. Maybe in a way that you don't, but no matter how great they seem, no matter how uh, advanced in the Christian life they might look, they have weaknesses that you don't know about. The playing field is extremely level. Every single one of us, we fear man. So what do we do? We repent and we confess that the fear of the Lord is what we need. Emmanuel, the Lord is our helper. We will not fear. What can man do to us? What can he do to us? Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, we are also tempted to, to fear things that we should not. Father, we're also tempted to allow others to loom as so large in our minds and in our hearts and for you to be small. But Lord, we need you. First and foremost, Lord, to, to rule on the throne of our hearts so that no matter what anyone else might do to us, Father, that we will rest in the comfort of a sovereign king. The Lord, the Lord our God is for us. Whom shall we fear? Father, we praise you for Jesus Christ, the one who satisfied the wrath that was due to us. And Father, we pray that as a result, we would stand firm, that we would stand with him and that we would be exalted with him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, we're going to stand and respond to the preaching of God's word with He Will Hold Me Fast. So if you would, please stand if you're able and we will sing together. a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together, and this is a celebration for Christians. So just to make a preface to say, this is for the family of God. This is for those who have been bought by the blood of Christ, those who are repenting and believing in the gospel. So if that's not you, then we ask that you would allow these elements to pass by you this morning. But we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We are going to read our church covenant together. So we've had it in mind that we would do this for a long time. And the reason why is because we want to remember what are we covenanting together uh, as we celebrate uh, the Lord's death, his resurrection. What are we promising to one another? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the introduction to our church covenant. And then you guys have a job. You guys are going to read with me the we statements uh, as we go through it, okay? Everybody clear on that? So what's your job? The we statements. My job, I'll introduce it, and I will uh, cover the, the closing statement, okay? On account of our confession of faith in Christ's death and resurrection on our behalf, namely, that he is the sinless son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us, and having been baptized into the name of the triune God, we do now solemnly covenant together as one body of Christ, that by God's grace and the aid of the Holy Spirit, 
we will seek to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We will seek to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, affectionately caring for one another in times of joy and sorrow out of a love for Christ. We will bear one another's burdens by serving, comforting, and praying for one another. We will eagerly maintain the bond of unity in the Spirit, committing to take offense slowly and being eager to reconcile with any who have offended us. We will bear fruit. We will participate in the Great Commission of Christ to make disciples by evangelizing, baptizing, and teaching individuals to obey all that Christ has commanded us. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry of the church, the relief of the needy, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. We will endeavor to maintain the great duty of both family and private worship as we seek to raise up those who at any time may be under our care and discipline and instruction of the Lord. We will diligently watch over ourselves, being just in our dealings and exemplary in our conduct. We will build church. We will covenant with another church or employ faith as soon as possible where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. We eagerly await the triumphal return of Christ when sin and death will be destroyed and we will dwell in the presence of God forever. Till then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Well, that's what we're covenanting together, uh, covenanting together uh, to do as a church. And let me just remind us of who we were before Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which we once walked, we no longer walk in them, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We all once lived in submission to the devil. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. So friends, as we remember the Lord's table, let's remember it's only by grace that we stand. It's only by the goodness of Christ and what he has done for us. So I'll ask the men to come forward and distribute the elements.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. For a moment, I want us to remember the body of Christ, the, the perfect one that was given for us. Let's remember the body of Christ. Take and eat. Well, Father, we praise you for the one who was pierced for our transgressions, the one who had no sin, neither was ever any deceit found in his mouth. He never feared man. He never shrunk back at what somebody else might think of him. He stood faithfully with you. He did everything that we can't. And Father, that's why this morning we come to you through him and him alone. Apart from Christ, we have nothing before you, Lord. But in the body of Christ given for us, we stand assured that we are forgiven. So we praise you for him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In a similar way, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So let's remember the blood of Christ that was shed for us, that, that precious blood that cleanses us from all of our sin. Let's remember the blood of Christ. Let's take and drink. Oh, Father, we stand in the blood of Christ. We are comforted even now 
by the blood of Christ that was shed for us. Oh Lord, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, Lord, help us to be single-minded in our devotion to you. Help us to fear you above all else and to remember that your wrath has been satisfied. And so therefore, our fear of you is a, is a joyful submission. It's an it's a eagerness to obey you at every turn. And Father, I pray that you would compel us by the power of your spirit that works mightily within your people for the glory of Christ's name and for the good of this church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are going to stand and respond uh, to the Lord's table by singing the doxology together. So let's stand and we'll sing together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You can sit down or you can stand up, whatever you prefer. I got just a few announcements for you. I'll get you out of here quickly. Uh, number one, the women's retreat. There's a new little handout. Hopefully you saw that in your bulletin. Uh, Sign-ups are open. We would ask you if you want to, to go ahead and, and make your sign up in the library after the service. Secondly, spring cleanup is uh, coming up, I believe it's next Saturday. Is that right, Jer? Where, where's Jer? Oh, Jer, there you are. Yeah, next Saturday. So uh, from 9 to 2, if you're interested in helping, and this is not just for you know, men or those who want to work outside, women, all the above. If you, even if you want to clean inside, and, and men, women, whoever that is, you are welcome. Uh, we're going to be cleaning inside the church as well. And then thirdly, evening worship service, just to keep it on your calendar, uh, in, in a couple weeks from now, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's table in the evening service, encourage you guys to come out to that. And then lastly, I know that we're a little over time, so I think it's especially important that we thank uh, the, the nursery workers and the children's workers. So I encourage you, if your kid is back there in some way, or, or if you see one of those volunteers, to encourage them and thank them for their service to the church. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you uh, that in Christ we stand and, and, and we have comfort and hope, Lord, that we will see him at the day of his resurrection. Would you cause us to stand mightily, Lord, in eager preparation for the day of his coming? We pray in his name. Amen.